What's up everyone? Well, today I'm going to go through some early development steps on these cork oak seedlings that are, I think, two years old. So I started a batch of these from some acorns that were picked in Davis by a friend of mine and uh, I think these were germinated over, you know, in early 2021, if I'm, no, early 2020, if I'm remembering correctly, and probably I am not. Anyway, um, so they've already been wired once, and you can kind of see that these all have some movement in the lower trunks, but these guys are pretty vigorous, and so it's already time to give them a second wiring. I will say that the way that you develop these is going to be very similar to the way that you would develop many other types of broadleaf evergreen or deciduous species and so you can kind of apply these techniques in some ways to many other trees. Before we go too much farther let's uh, let's take a quick look back at Mike Pistello's cork oak which is one of the nicest ones that I've seen recently. The story behind the gentleman was he was uh, he traveled a lot and he would go to different countries and bring back this seeds from different oak trees he was like just loved oak so he had nice. just a plethora of variety of, of oak trees, all from seeds. And these, what I'm told is that these are, uh, most of his older trees, which this one would be considered an older one, is about 45 to 50 years old from seed that he grew. That is some pretty wicked movement for a cork oak. Usually you see them, they're kind of like ramrod straight. <laughs> exactly, and so that's, and not only movement, but taper as well. I wasn't too happy with the branching, so what I did was like, this is another one where I just cut everything off, just down to the trunk. So all the branches that you see here now, except for uh, this thicker one here, um, everything on here has been grown over the last two or three years. So this is a, this is a complete remake. Got a good climate for it. Yeah, and they, and they grow like crazy. Um, there's been a little bit of question from certain people asking me about this branch, you know, why isn't it too heavy to be that high up on the tree? And, and my answer to that is I think that Yes, the, the answer would be yes, but what do you, the pros and cons of what you would lose and gain if you cut it off, you'd have a huge scar. And I thought it was an old branch and it, it doesn't really bother me when I look at it because there's another kind of old branch back here, uh, almost like a secondary trunk. Yeah, that one's pretty cool. It's like snaky. Yeah, and it's got some movement to it. And so, with that there, I think if that wasn't there, it might make this a little bit more difficult to stomach, but because it is there, I feel like there's sort of a balance amongst the three. And it's almost like it's almost like it's three different trunks. So you have, you know, this one, the main leader, and then this one there. So um, I think I agree with you, but it's like, it's hard not to cut off like a big branch like that when there's no other branches. But exactly. by the time, you know, five years from now, when those branches are all kind of like filled out and, and there's more taper in the rest of the branches and whatnot, you'll probably think of it more like a feature than a, exactly. Than a fault. Exactly, exactly, so. So when I'm working on trees, I always like to get a sense of what the roots look like and with these growing containers that I'm using here and because they've been in here for a while I can actually literally just kind of pull these out and for the most part the roots are not going to fall apart or the the, the root ball is not going to disintegrate on me because the roots are holding all the soil together so the roots in this case look pretty good as I would expect from the top of the tree looking nice and healthy like it does but it's always kind of interesting to to just sort of pull if you're doing a batch of trees to pull one of them out and, and double check. So the other thing I could check is the Nabari, but I am going to leave that until the next time that I repot these. And each time you work on a tree, uh, whether it's repotting work or work on the top, you should be looking to improve it. And so the main thing that I can do with these guys right now is just to add additional wire. Now, if you're not already familiar, uh, I'll just add a little bit of color here while I'm wiring this tree. Cork oaks are actually the source of corks that are used for wine bottles and cork that is used in cork flooring and other applications, a cork board, all those kinds of things. And what they do is they harvest the bark off of the tree without 
killing it. So the cork is a fire adaptation that helps insulate the tree. It's native to the Mediterranean, places like Spain. And so to protect itself from fire, it's evolved the cork covering to basically insulate the live cambium layer from being damaged uh, from wildfires. So in harvesting cork, people are making the trees more susceptible to fire, but it is a renewable resource in the sense that it only takes the tree a few years to create another layer of cork and then it can be reharvested. So the tree is not cut down or, or damaged. And <laughs> you guys can correct me if, I, uh, if I'm incorrect, but I've actually seen, it's kind of funny, the, the trees after the cork has been harvested look kind of like a, a shaved poodle because the, the main trunk and the main branches have had all the cork removed, so they're actually smaller than some of the branches that are out further, which still have cork on them. Uh, all right, so I've put a number three aluminum wire onto the trunk here, and I've wired it just like this was the first time wiring. Now, multiple uh, rounds of wiring is sometimes necessary in early development because last time this tree was wired, it was probably only this big. And if I wait too long, I won't be able to get these sharp kinds of turns. So I wanted to get these wired while they were still small. Uh, but now that it's grown out more, I'm not really gonna be bending this part. I'm just adding movement from, from, here, from here upward. And so this is all just here for anchor purposes. Now, when you're making this kind of movement in your tree, one of the things that you need to kind of take into account is what your plan is for how large the tree is going to be ultimately. It's not that you can't change your mind later, but the tightness of the curves has an effect on the shape of the trunk, but it also has an effect on the overall movement and your overall composition. So say, if I wanted to make a mame out of this and I was gonna cut it down this low, I would have just then removed all of this, this movement that I've created just now with this wire. And that's not a problem if I come back and try that later. But if I've only got movement in this section and then the next you know, foot or whatever of the trunk is straight and I wanna make a medium sized tree out of this, I don't have the same kind of good options that I, that I might otherwise have if I wired it like this. So the radius and, and sort of overall shape of the bends that you're creating has an impact on the size of the tree that it is more sort of inclined to become later. So keep in mind, like if you wanna make a 12 inch tree, then your turns need to be tighter than if you wanna make an 18 inch tall tree. And cork oaks, unlike some of the other species that I work with, are not as well adapted to making little teeny tiny trees. Obviously, like the leaves are a little bit bigger, they do reduce and become smaller, but it's not gonna be nearly as easy to make a mame out of this, uh, something under three inches, as it is to make, say, like a 12 to 18 inch tall, tall tree. So keep in mind those scales and think about like, okay, if this is going to be an 18 inch tall tree, this is only about say seven or eight inches of height here. Maybe that's all just the first section of the trunk. And then the next section, so I lean it over like this, and then the next section starts to come back like this. Don't forget that you wanna have three dimensional movement. You don't just want like a kind of flat S curve so that if you turn it to the side, that you end up with something that is relatively straight. So if I turn this to the side, I see some wiggles going like this. The other thing in my compositions that I like to see for in informal uprights at least is that I kind of like, if you're looking at the tree from the side, I like the trunk to go slightly back and then come back forward at the top. But it depends on the style that you're creating with these guys. So don't try to plan too far ahead. You'll have multiple opportunities as you continue working with your plant to make decisions down the road. And if I try to design this inevitably, it's not going to turn out the way that I design it, you know, all the way from bottom to top five or 10 years from now as the trunk gets bigger and so on. Now, this one is the same age, but the trunk is still significantly smaller than the one I was just working with. But the interesting thing is that it's actually sent out multiple sort of side shoots. So this was the one that was wired and it looks like that's gotten a little bit weak. And now the tree's decided it's gonna try to 
to shoot off and, and leave behind this wire growth and just sort of start a new straighter leader. So that's pretty common with these guys. It's pretty common with a lot of trees, uh, like hawthorns, maples. If you bend something over, a lot of times the tree will just sprout out from the base of that bend and create a new vertical leader. So what I have a tendency to do rather than cut these off is to just wire those as well in order to create more movement in them. But it also gives you the opportunity to create a different type of taper. So let me get this wire on here and then we'll compare. All right, so comparing these two, uh, this one doesn't have any side branches low down. And so I've just gone ahead and wired the trunk. This is probably, you know, at this point anyway, and those things, kinds of things can change, maybe better suited to a, you know, a medium sized tree. Whereas, whereas this has the potential to be a smaller tree because I've got more branching and whatnot down here. Now, if I cut this back, I would end up with more branching lower down on this one as well. Now, one of, the th one of the other things that is very different about these two is that with the different growth patterns that I have going in them, we're gonna end up with different taper in the trunk. So if I just set these aside, assume that I take the wire off at the right time so that it doesn't scar the branches and put them into larger containers and all of these things start running as you know equal sort of contributors to the, the development of the wood in the lower trunk and the roots and everything, then this one, so say this is the top of the tree and these are branches, these are gonna have, it's gonna have multiple big kind of twisty big branches. And so the trunk down here will be the biggest, but then it'll have some taper through this section. With this one, with a single sacrifice branch that's at the top, you're gonna get kind of a, like a, not very much taper in this section. Now the cork might help you in the case of a cork bark oak a little bit, but it's not gonna help you a lot. And that means that uh, without too much taper, you might then have to come back and cut it, like trunk chop it essentially, in order to start more taper. So think about those kinds of things as you're working with your young seedlings like this because it determines the options that you will have later as you continue to develop them. So I am kind of trying to twist this as I, as I bend it. And I like to do that with trees. It usually creates more interest in the bark, which you can't see now, but as the tree continues to mature, you will see the, the sort of things that are done to it now will come out as the tree continues to develop. And as you might be guessing, this one is relatively similar to the first one that I did but that doesn't mean that it will continue to develop the same as the first one. So I'm really just trying to get some nice movement in here and use this wire to make sure that I don't have straight sections. Now, this one has like a bud coming out here, which I've just sort of tilted to the side. It wouldn't surprise me if this thing starts taking off and making a pretty strong shoot uh, because they have a tendency to do that when they're stronger. These gallons that I have are the same batch, they're the same age as the trees that I have in the three inch containers. It's just that when I potted them up out of the common flats, I put some of them in three inch and some of them into gallons. All the ones that I put in gallons are already, even just you know less than a year later, already significantly bigger on average than the ones that are in the three inch containers. And they also seem to have more sort of multiple shoots there's more of them that look like this, where there's you know five, six, seven shoots coming out of various places. So the part of this that was wired, if you can see it, is right here. And then this part is wired over and there's a barely a wire scar right there. So this is sort of like, you know, a couple of months on or, or a year on, or depending on how fast you get them to grow from this kind of a situation. So it's, it's sent out multiple shoots. And so you're starting to build that taper in the trunk and this part of the trunk tapers to this part of the trunk because this is coming in low. Ultimately, I think that'll probably just end up being a sacrifice branch. 
but it also depends on whether or not this part of the tree continues growing strongly. The largest shoot on here is actually coming from kind of the base of the wired section. And so I might wanna go ahead and put a wire on that as well. Whereas this shoot for whatever reason has gotten weak and it is higher up on the wired section. Now, in terms of timing of this work, it's late summer right now, and I tend to like to work on oaks when they're actively growing, and I work on deciduous oaks in the spring. I've, it's always really tempting to work on deciduous oaks in the winter because there's no leaves on them, and you think, oh, it's very easy to wire the branches. And in my experience, at least with California deciduous oaks, wiring bare branches uh, in winter immediately causes branch dieback, whereas in spring, you can take the growth and wire it without any real fear of causing branch dieback. It's one of those really frustrating, paradoxical things. So there's leaves all over the place. It's really hard to get in there with the wire, but that's what uh, leads to better results uh, from, from the wiring operation. With these guys, I would treat them pretty much the same. I think there's a little bit more leeway, but treating them, basically wiring them when they're actively growing rather than when they're kind of sitting there dormant during cooler periods like winter or even late fall and early spring before they start budding out. I would wait for them to be actively growing before you perform any significant wiring and bending operations just to make sure that you don't um, cause dieback because the, the plant isn't immediately able to repair the damage that you do as a result of bending. All right, I hope that helps you guys with some early development on cork oaks. If you've been growing cork oaks and want to share your experience with everyone, put it in the comments below. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you next time.